You're not going to be able to survive on your craft as they teach you in school, and it's a problem. Hello, my digital friends. My name is Sean Black and welcome to In The Black. An especially warm welcome to all of you uh, tuning in to our first episode of In The Black Profiles, a segment of our channel dedicated to sitting down with high performers and overachievers from all sectors of the economy to see exactly what the disciplines, principles, habits, and thought processes are that allow them to rise to the top of their fields and share how others can follow along in their footsteps to really achieve similar successes. Today, I'm super happy to be kicking off our first episode with a very special guest that we have been that we've been super excited to feature on In the Black ever since uh, our inception. To most of you in the architecture, commercial real estate, and construction sectors, Mark Spector is a name that certainly needs no introduction. <laughs> and his firm, Spector Group, have been doing incredible work at scale across all aspects of the built environment uh, since in inception, which I think is 1955. Uh, when Mark's father, Michael, first opened shop from his garage in Great Neck, like Steve Jobs, um, Michael Spector, uh, went on to design over a hundred buildings across Long Island, literally changing the face of suburban architecture uh, as, it was, as it was known at the time. And it's clear that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. After ha having earned his master's of architecture from the University of Michigan, Mark joined his father and brother at the firm in 1989 and has since grown the business into an internationally renowned practice collecting design accolades and, and, and setting countless architectural precedents in his wake. I, I personally count myself fortunate to call Mark uh, Spector a dear friend and, and trusted collaborator for many years now. And I'm super happy to have him to, to be sitting here with you today, Mark. So, so a huge welcome. Uh, you know, how, how have you been? Sean, wow, what an introduction. Uh, I'm like a legend in my own mind. <laughs> That's great. You, you are you're absolutely one of the legends and we're super happy to have you. And, uh, you know, here we're, we're super happy to hear about the, the, your path, um, uh, you know, the trials and tribulations that you can share with our viewers about, you know, how you, you know, achieve certain milestones to get you to where you are today. But most of all, the failures that you've actually had to endure, because I think that that is um, some of the things that that, that th those are some of the items that tend to be overlooked by many people. You know, I was an Olympic athlete and um, uh, I used to, I always say uh, uh, that, you know, what an Olympic athlete does on the, in the ring, on the field, on the mat is really not that impressive. I mean, they're supposed to do that because they've spent, you know, 10,000 plus hours doing that over and over again in practice. And so what, what's really impressive is, is what, what people had to endure to actually be able to deliver that exceptional performance. So, uh, you know, first of all, you know, big congratulations, I want to say to your nephew, uh, Jake, because I, I, I understand from LinkedIn that he just recently graduated with his master's in architecture and is about to join the firm. Yeah, Jake Spector, uh, my brother Scott Spector's son, um, is joining the firm next week, actually. Yeah, and will be the fourth generation uh, to come into the family business. Again, you said it. The firm was founded by my grandfather Charles Spector, then with my father Michael Spector in 1965. Yeah, and now Scott and I are principals and owners, and will translate down to to Jake over the next several years. And to have a family business not just thrive but really grow dimensionally since its inception yeah. to pass it down is a feed onto itself in a, in a very competitive no work environment. We're very, very excited to have him come on board. No question. I'm, I'm curious, um, 
um, uh, in, in was 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 architecture something uh, that was always a dream for him, or is it something that he gradually developed interest in over time? He, because so of his close proximity, obviously, with family. Did so you, there are no, so there are nine grandkids to my father, Michael Spector. Okay. Um, one has chosen the path of, of architecture. Um, small percentage, but we're happy we have one. Right. Um, and Jake, similar to myself and my brother, showed a, an interest in it very early on in his um, high school career. He is a sketch artist, which is a fantastic attribute to being an architect. Not many architects can really sketch beautifully initially. Right. And so he fell in love with it. And now that he has a chance to join his father and myself, um, it's, uh, it's pretty special. I imagine that's an incredibly great skill to have uh, when you can actually draw a sketch live in front of somebody rather than having to go back to a computer program and be confined you know, to the program parameters. Absolutely. I am not a pure sketch artist, but I keep a sketch pad next to my bed and I have done so for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. That is where I realistically ideate a lot of what comes to life here at the Spectre Group, whether it's a simple two or three lines or an actual sketch of a layout. It comes, it's formulated in my mind and it has to get on paper immediately or sometimes I will forget about that. Sure. What's the most interesting part of that is that a lot of our completed work, if you go back to its origin of thought, is from that one sketch. And so we've kept a record of this now. And obviously, we have just books and books of this over the last 30 years. Yeah, that's that's ama that's amazing. Um, um, uh, but, the, the, but there was a time before. Uh, you know, keeping that sketchbook right by your bedside before that came into, you know, in, into focus. Tell us a little bit about Mark Spector, uh, your early childhood, um, uh, you know, and, and, and how it was that, you know, we, clearly your father had a huge influence. Uh, but, but tell us how you decided to, you know, sometimes people take for granted that just because you are, you know, maybe a legacy child, that it's, 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 it's a, it's automatic that you end up in the career that your parents are in or your father's in or your mother's in. Uh, but, but sometimes, you know, children growing up can, can really take a much different uh, course just because, you know, they want to, they, they really want to sort of strike out on their own. But, but, but for you, uh, you clearly embraced architecture uh, and design from it from an early age. So tell us a, a little bit about that and how you, uh, you, you what your upbringing was like. Well, it, it was really driven by my father and my grandfather. So we really got it from both sides. Mm -hmm. And we lived and breathed design growing up. We would go on the weekends. My father would pile us into the car and we would go visit the dirt. That's really what was always said to us. We're going to visit project sites. Right. We're going to walk the construction. The basics. The, right. So we got, you know, we learned early on the essence of creativity. We, we lived in it. Our home that we grew up in uh, on Long Island was designed and built by my father. Mm -hmm. And we saw it very early on what it takes to create and to institute design into construction, into completion. And then I knew I was good at it. Yeah. Early on, from a thought process, um, I did well with it in in high school, um, and then knew that that's really what I wanted to do. But empirically, I wasn't sure. I just wanted to be an architect. Okay. Because I had a very strong business mind yeah. and a desire to be in development as well. But I knew the architecture degree, the core profession of architecture, as a professional was critical and I needed to have that under my belt and went through the necessary schooling to become yeah. a licensed registered architect because in theory, as a professional, you know, I could be a sole practitioner if it ever came to bear. I have a license to practice in 26 states and I could do so whether or not I had the backing of my firm or if it 
it was just myself. And that's a very important item to rely upon from a sustainability standpoint. Yeah, but no question. Go, keep going. Yep, yep. The schooling of architecture is extremely demanding. And the dropout rate of those that go into it initially, not really knowing the, the magnitude of the, of the schooling, mm -hmm. um, you really have to have the stomach for it. Yeah. It's like going to law school or to medical school, as it was it relates to classes and exams and then to become registered. Right. So it's a very rigorous program and it kind of vets out who really want to practice and who just aren't cut out for it. Right. But the, the profession of architecture is now just not limited to practicing architecture. And I lecture at various universities around the country about the best business practices of architecture. And what I'm seeing is that you can use this degree, this profession, this education, and do so many things with it that benefit the, the profession, that benefit mankind Right. That um, I'm seeing more and more of that interest. <clears throat> yeah, that's a, that's a, that's amazing. I mean, really, at the end of the day, you're 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 providing housing for people. You're providing spaces where people live, work, pray, play, and sleep. Right. That's right. really how we phrase it. It's, I, I it's like it. all aspects of life, no matter what you're doing. And even more so now, returning and emerging from this pandemic, where the architect is now really considered essential sure. in, the, in the bouncing forward and the rebirth of, of business and of life, that people have a, a whole different perspective of, of what an architect does and the importance sure. of the profession. Sure, sure, sure. Um, uh, I really appreciate uh, you hearing that and hearing your perspective. And, and, and uh, something you said about the rigor really sort of um, uh, rang true to me. And I think, about, I think about your early years and I think about my early years in, in the real estate. Uh, my uncle ran a, a large uh, commercial real estate service firm in Canada, the largest commercial real estate service firm in Canada, bro brokerage company. Uh, and I had the benefit of uh, being close to him and, and, and seeing the business firsthand. Um, and I, I imagine, you know, I've, I've seen a lot throughout the course of my career and I understand the difficulty in, 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 in any pro profession that requires real professionalism. Um, and I was curious about, um, you know, some of the professional hardships that, that you were able to overcome that maybe some of your other younger colleagues um, uh, uh, had tr had challenges with and, and, and caused them to actually reconsider the profession and, and maybe no longer be there. You know, what are some of the things that, that those, those hardships, those, those, you know, because I imagine as an architect, you must go into your, you go into your profession like any young kid coming out of college with incredible ideals about, you know, the impact you're going to have on the world. And then you get into reality and you start facing some of these, these obstacles, these mild, the, the, these obstacles that, that, you know, are, are, you, know, you, you have to face pretty seriously. And, you know, what are some of those hardships that you can, can recall and, you know, how, how did you address them? And, and, and you, you, them? you raised some very, very important thoughts, Sean. And again, this is something that I do lecture about because those that are going through the schooling process, whether you're getting a bachelor's of architecture or a master of architecture, you're not really being educated in the actual business practices of working in a firm and running a firm, if you desire, and making a living at this profession. Yes. If you look at the art and look at an architecture on the compensation scale as it relates to kids young adults coming out of college with a law degree or a master's in business degree mm -hmm. and coming out with a master's of architecture, yes. there is, they are not relatable as it relates to um, salaries coming out of school. I see. So the perception of the architect is not commensurate with its liability or its responsibility as a profession. And I've spent a lot of time educating the community 
the profession, the business world about why that is so slanted in the wrong direction. Interesting. And I, and I have come across just a, a stone wall of it being, look, this is what it is. The market will pay you X coming out of school. Yet we understand the importance of this profession, but it's not, it, it needs to be changed. It needs to be lobbied. It needs to be improved. So these kids that come out can actually earn a living within this profession and do what they love to do. You're not going to be able to survive on your craft yes. as they teach you in school. And it's a problem. And so when I lecture about this, um, it's eye-opening for these kids that are coming out and they are so grateful that someone is actually telling them exactly what the real world is going to right. look like once you hit the ground running. Yes. And that alone, if we could break through that and garnish, I would say, the respect that we know the profession demands, again, based on what our responsibility and our liabilities are, it would be a different world. Yes, of course. Of course, yes. So you take on huge liability in terms of, of what, what you're absolutely, what, what you're creating, because someone, if something happens in the future, they're going, someone is going to come back and, and, and look at you and, and question um, the, the, the design integrity of the, uh, exactly. the project or the plans and uh, you, you may have missed something. So what I think what you're saying is that the magnitude of the responsibility that you are required to take on quite naturally in building structures uh, creates an, an incredible liability in the future. And there's the, the, so there's the compensation level is not commensurate with that risk that you take on. Not at all. And there's two, there's two roads to that. So we have a responsibility and liability to our clients and to the actual physical product that we are designing and documenting that is getting constructed. Yes. Whether it's a home, whether it's an office building, whether it's a hotel, whatever it might be from the structure itself, we have that liability and responsibility. Okay. But now forward thinking, it's not just that. We have a complete responsibility now to the health of this planet as it relates to carbon neutrality, net zero energy design, passive design, where we are creating edifices for the long term that have to be completely neutral in its footprint from an environmental standpoint. Mm -hmm. And that is now as important, maybe even more so important than the, the actual physical structure itself, is what are we doing on that side of the Sustainability. Ledger? And so we'll, yeah, so everything that comes out of the Spectre Group now and has been, but is really perfected is completely sustainable and where we can be carbon neutral and net zero energy, which is producing an envelope in a product where it, it's an equalization of energy in versus energy out. And we're seeing a lot of this work now in student housing, we call it student life. Yeah in our modular practice, which is taking off across the country, because we're creating these boxes now that are completely carbon neutral. And that just has a, just a complete negative footprint effect on, on where we're building. And well, so yeah. that's where we're headed. That, that's, that's super, that's super fa fascinating. Um, that leads into uh, the, the next question I wanted to ask in terms of uh, just just misconceptions about uh, the architectural business, and and I think you touched a little bit on uh, um, you know misconceptions that, that that some young people may have entering the business, and in, in, in regard to the, the the misalignment between compensation and, and risk levels that that one takes on it, and 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 I'm and I'm and I'm curious, um, uh, uh, you know what what might be some other misconceptions that uh, people who are entering the business may uh, take may, may not actually realize i mean i'll give you an example in the commercial real estate brokerage business um that i think there's one the, the misconception that many people have about this business is that you have all of these revenue generating uh brokers 
just making millions and gazillions of, of dollars that they, they can't find you know, enough vaults to put the money in. And so these young people come into the business and they believe that they're going to become multimillionaires year one. And they're faced with the harsh reality that it is in many ways a grind and that it's, you know, a five to 10 year plan uh, and that it, 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 it requires much more of them than what they had initially thought. The complexities of, of projects requires much more. And I'm, and I'm curious, um, and, and, and the way that they actually work with colleagues requires so much more. And their, their, the, the, their understanding of architecture, finance, legal um, uh, development, all, of, all construction, all of these things need to come together uh, uh, to be able to have a successful commercial real estate brokerage business. Um, what are those similar types of misconceptions that you see on a on day in, day out that you could sort of, you know, if, if you were going to gu guide a young person that was entering the business, you know, what are some of those things that you would, you would let them know that they need to be mindful of because things are not always as they seem? So, so Sean, that's another very good question. So, we are all about mentoring at the Spectre Group. When we hire new team members, we assign them a mentor that is going to spend the time with them, not just to teach them the, the ropes of, of working within the culture of the Spectre Group. And I, I think we have a very unique culture as it relates to how we work with our teams. Um, but also how to educate them in, in the, the business protocols of, of actually working within a firm. It is completely yes. different than a school experience. These kids, sometimes they've come out of school, whether you're coming out of the best schools in the country or, or others, you know, they're wide-eyed and they feel that they, they know everything and they simply want to just get to work and dive into a project and begin to design and begin to take control of, yeah. of their path, uh, which is yeah. terrific, by the way, because this profession requires a passion for the field because that offsets the disproportionate compensation scale. You have to be a passionate person to want to be in architecture. Yeah. I, can teach, I can teach anyone any skill at Spectre Group, how to use any computer program, how to build and create a great set of construction documents. I can't teach you love and passion for the field. And that's 50%. Right. Um, but our mentoring program is not just about Spectre Group, it's about the profession at large. And I always say my greatest success and my father's greatest success are those that have come to work with us, that have spent a lot of time with us, that have learned from us, that we have taught well, that then feel successful and confident in themselves to go and start their own firm. Right. And we have launched dozens of successful architectural practices throughout the country of those that started and originated their careers with us. We have no ownership stakes in those firms. We have no interest in them financially at all. We're, we just know that they started with us and we were able to give them their wings that they needed for them to go. Now that's one group. We also have tremendous talent here at the Spectre Group that have been with us for 20, 30, and even 40 years that have built a career under the Spectre brand and are members of the Spectre family, yeah. how we operate as a culture, who continue to do phenomenal design and technical yeah. work across our practices. And they are unique. And if you think about what I just said, to have someone other than, let's say, a family member, uh, to stay with one organization, yes, that many years is a testament to our culture, our the way we operate and the value we place on on our team members. Yeah, that's that's that is. Uh, I, I think that the uh, in any organization, culture is so important, and it's it it it's 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 a testament to what you have been able to achieve that you have been able to keep 
uh, you know, this, this family run organization and recruit, you know, uh, uh, other family members is just, is, is really astonishing. Um, uh, you know, I know that when I was younger, I had an opportunity to work with, you know, another family member and, uh, I found it extremely difficult. It just didn't work out. But fortunately my, you know, when, when I turned to real estate and my, my other uncle, it was, uh, it was, it was a natural fit. Um, and I'm curious when you think about the growth of um, of an individual professional in the real estate sector, and you think about the onset of COVID, and you think about uh, remote work and and, and digital work. Um, how do you think? How, how do you? How, you know, what do you say to to young people who say, "Well, I can just work digitally. I can work remotely. I don't need to actually be interacting with you, uh, you know, at, at the office in a physical environment. We can do this, um, you know, remotely. You know, we, and I ask that question because all of the change is happening. And, and you mentioned something about mentoring, and I'm and I'm curious if you feel that technology and remote uh, that is that is that is you know. Uh, 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 attracting so much attention today is a, a, a huge challenge uh, for anybody who decides that they want to spend more time, you know, outside of the office than, than directly interacting with someone physically, particularly, you know, uh, you know, a senior member of your team that's to help their, to help their career advancement. Well, again, that's another very good question, Sean, and that is the topic of the day, right? Are we working from home? Are we working from anywhere? Or are we working from the office space? Yeah. So COVID was an enlightening experience. As, as devastating as it has been on us here in New York and other markets that we practice in, um, those that are the most innovative will rise to the top and, and get through this successfully. And thankfully, we are seeing a very strong light at the end of this tunnel. So during that time of COVID, you know, we built a virtual platform called Spectre Virtual. Spectre Virtual, because, okay, okay, Spectre exciting. Because there were so many architects and designers that got laid off and lost their job, not just here in New York, but across the country, we found a vehicle for them and created as such for them to freelance for us for various tasks on various projects. Okay. We have built a platform. It sounds like you're becoming a tech company, Mark. Well, a little bit. Okay. We built a platform of over, I think right now we're at least 250 across the country and the world of those that we can tap into for anything that we might need as a firm. They are not going to be spending time physically within my two offices. To be clear, these are freelance at will on a need basis. Right. And we continue to find and grow that platform. The offices are now 100% back live, period. There is no more work from home or work from anywhere unless under extreme circumstances. Look, we successfully migrated to a seamless remote environment overnight like everyone else did. We have all these technologies at our fingertips. We were able to continue to do our business 100% remote for many, many, many months. Yes. We maintained our culture with our people as best as we could. And we were successful in maintaining all of our staffing levels. We didn't lose one person from a layoff or furlough, and we maintain full staffing levels. Now, as it has been really since, I would say, mid-April, end of April, we are 2021, we are fully 100% back, period. Okay. Both offices, in particular the Long Island office, everyone is now vaccinated. And so we're following CDC guidelines and we're not yep. mandatory to wear masks now because we're all vaccinated. Yep. But there is, and, and the culture of working together collaboratively over drawings and sketch paper and ideating and gesticulating live has returned to us and has created a newfound energy and buzz 
that people are now genuinely excited about and want to be here. And we're holding live meetings now in our offices with our clients. They're coming back to us. And so we really are taking the lead, and I'm very verbal about this, and I'm very outward spoken about this on where I can have that bully pulpit. Yeah. And I'm demanding that my contemporaries, other management and leaders of, of firms like myself do the same thing. You mean come back to the office? Yeah, because if you don't, then who's going to? If you don't lead by example, then who's going to? Yes. So if not you, then who? And that's the model. And if I am just out there and I get criticized for it, I do. But also I get people energized about it. And so they're following suit. Not to, not as fast as we are. Look, we're the sixth largest in New York. Yeah. So we've got some leverage in the community. But those in the top five have not returned to full um, employment live in the workplace yet. And I'm hopeful that they do sooner than later. I, I think I think it's a matter of time. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, it, it's interesting. We we always had the ability to work remote. That, that was never that, that was never a problem. Right. We always had, were able to do that. Uh, it was just a matter of. Uh, uh, you know, corporate policies that sort of frowned on it for some time. But when you start to see movement and change, like like J.P. Morgan Chase, yes, is have people 100% back. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Facebook is now increasing the number, the percentage of people returning to the office. So is Google. Yeah. Once you see these names, and Amazon as well, just announced that the the Audible campus that we designed in Newark, which is this picture right behind me, yeah. will be 100% back you know, by the fall. That's meaningful. And that's the leadership that this country and this world needs because we have to get everybody back to the workplace for us to sustain the society that we've built. It all waterfalls down, not just the workplace, but everything that feeds underneath it will not return and be brought back to, to where we were pre-COVID unless this all happens. Right. And I'm determined to do my part. Yeah, I think that uh, you know we 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 can sometimes be very extreme in our in our um, um, uh, decision making process uh, as a society. So uh, it you know that we can sometimes be too rash and sometimes be too slow in making decisions. And uh, in terms I'm not. I'm not I'm not diminishing the impact of COVID on our world, our country, our city. It was absolutely devastating. The loss of life is unimaginable. You can't even get your arms around. It. Yes. By no means am I doing that. But COVID, so this look, so Spectre Group is in its 55th year of doing business. Okay. COVID itself lasted one year. Are we going to change the policy of everything because of one sliver? The answer is no. We're going to learn from this devastation. We're going to be better people. We're going to be a better society. That is the goal. That is the must. If we don't learn from this, then why go through this? Yes. And I know I have learned as a person, as a professional, personally, emotionally, mentally, that I am, I am better than I was in March 2020. There is no doubt about it. I am thankful, grateful that, you know, that those that I love are okay. And I've known those that have lost loved ones due to COVID that I, I weep and I cry for. And all of that collectively has made me a better father, husband, and leader. And that I'll take with me in perpetuity. That's great. Uh, you know, I think that um, uh, running an organization, you have to have all of those qualities. You've got to be the father. You've got to be a leader. Uh, uh, you, you need to have a, a diverse set of skill sets to be able to deal with Wear all these hats. People of different ages, people of different personalities, people of different cultures, um, people of different. It's not easy, by the way. Sometimes, sometimes people think it is easy. Yes, yes. And you know, it's. It's it's twenty four seven work to to stay ahead of it. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, look, you have such a great pedigree. You've been around for so long. Um, uh, you've performed at the at the highest levels. You've done some of the, um, um, uh, you've done you know some of the. You, you've worked with some of the most choice companies. Um, uh, you named just a few in this this interview. What are some of the things that you, that you know someone someone who's ready for step to step into the real estate business and step into the, the whether it's whether it's architecture whether it's real estate services you know I, in the entire and someone contemplating entering the real estate sector what are some of the things that they shouldn't do they should really think twice about doing because they are they are the 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 amateur mistakes that you have seen occur time and time again that don't yield the right kind of return for people trying to launch their career and get to the next level. Do you have some insight into that? It would be great if you could share some of those things, you know, in employing such a large number of people as you do, uh, I would imagine not only from your own experience you might be able to draw from, but, you know, somewhat from the, the experience that you've seen others undergo. Hmm. It, it, again, it's it's another phenomenal question. We got some good ones here today, Sean. No, I, think, uh, I take that as a compliment. No, absolutely. Look, look, I I fail every day of my life. Something happens during the day that I fail, and I don't go home at night and reflect upon my day of where I could do better. I just know that I I, I need to learn from what occurred. Yeah whether it's something simple and small a behavior or something I might've said to someone, um, anything. That's how I become a better person and leader each day. And, but the, the one common thread though, that I have found that has brought me success and what I, it took me time to learn is regardless of circumstance, personally, professionally, you've got to number one, always be kind. And I always say to my people, kill them with kindness. No matter what yes. the circumstance is, kill them with kindness. Have empathy for those that you're working for, and those that work for you. You really do not know what their personal story is. And you should never, ever place judgment or assume something is... It's so easy to get caught into that, that trap. You could fall into it immediately. And then it becomes a vortex tunnel downward. You've got to stay out of that. Yeah. And, and for me, now that I've been doing this for 30 years, which I cannot believe I'm personally doing this for 30 years, is that you want to work with those that really want to work with you. If you can find sure. that commonality and have the desire with their brand like Amazon and JP Morgan Chase and Northwestern Mutual and all these phenomenal companies that came to my brand to work with their brand is meaningful. And I judge my success not so much based on how incredibly beautiful or efficient and how many of those workplaces are and how many awards I have won. Yeah. That's, that's not important to me. Okay. My success is based on my friendships that I have created with that started out as simply being hired as your architect. Right. And spending that time together and what happens after the project is finished. And I have all these individuals that I now call true friends. Right. Going through that experience. And that's my baseline of success. Right. Yes. That's so terrific. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the process of, of, of going through a very long and arduous process, people learn a lot about you. They learn about your character. And when your clients now become your friends, uh, because they've been able to witness the, um, uh, your character uh, and uh, your performance level, that is that 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 really allows you to get to the next level. That takes time. I think a lot of people don't understand that that takes time. You can't rush that. You know, you can't be efficient about that process. Trying to be efficient about that process is a recipe for a disaster. It really. But, what, but what's important about the friendship piece of it is not just going out to have cocktails. You know, six months after a project is finished, right. it allows for transparency and true honesty about 
the success and or failure of a project. And look, not every project that we've done has is 100% successful. We learn from those that we had challenges with. But I maintain those friendships because that opened the door to honesty, where you could have a, a post-mortem conversation on what went well and what did not go well. Yes. And that's how we get better as architects, as designers, as people. You know, I just recently, we were not awarded a project that I felt so good about that I, we spent a fair amount of time doing our research and pursuing and being interviewed and being shortlisted. Yes. And we were not selected. But yet the client was kind enough to spend 90 minutes with me on the phone to talk me through why I was not selected. And so I have that relationship, but I learned from that. And that's the only way I can do better the next time. That's great. That's so great. I'm curious, um, did the client call you or did you, did they, did they offer that out of the blue or did you take the, make the effort to call them, thank them uh, and, and, and question them about why you might not have made uh, the, the cut or the short list? Did, did, was that a proactive step on your part? Because I think that, uh, you know, some people might find that hard to do. It was, it was completely proactive on my part, but it's very great. well received. And I learned a lot, quite honestly. I learned where I fell short. I learned where I did well. And I learned what I did for the next time. But what that also showed me is that it's very important to have these conversations, not just where you may win or where you might lose, because the conversation is, well, why? what if you win a project? Why did you select me? Right. But to spend the time when a project is complete to really do a comprehensive download on the successes and failures of a completed project. Right. And those could be day long seminars if the client is willing to do it. And we really request that feedback constantly. And they're happy to provide it. Yes. They're not going to offer it, interestingly enough. But if you request it and are personal about it, yes, they will, they will provide it to you. You know, the architectural community, at least at the level that we are working at right now, is a very close-knit community. Sure, everyone knows uh, each other, yeah? Everyone knows each other personally. Sure. We're, we're at events together. We socialize in the same networks together. There's not a lot of animosity whatsoever. It's competitive. Sure. It's engaging. Not everyone's right for the same, for every project. It's all personality driven. It's chemistry and who rubs who the right way and who does someone want to spend the next six months, a year, two years with side by side. Those are nuances. Absolutely. And it's with every profession. It is not just limited to architecture. It's yeah. brokerage as well. You compete yes. in your space. We compete in our space. But as long as it's done professionally and with respect for one another, is is the is absolute paramount and i think sometimes what's happening emerging from this pandemic in particular is that there is a rush to secure work due to the tsunami of activity that we're now seeing ourselves in and all i simply ask is that all of us in our space that there is plenty to go around yes and let it all just unfold but maintain true to your values and your culture and the integrity of the profession is at stake. And that should never be compromised for any one client. And not everybody are, are playing by those, you know, un, you know, um, un, you know, subliminal rules of engagement. Sure, sure. Yeah, um, so much of what you said res resonated so deeply with me. Um, uh, you know, I think that there is incredible hesitation by young people uh, uh, when they enter into a business, regardless of what the industry is. Um, they can It can be very hard on them when they have a failure. It can be crushing. Devastating. Yep. And, and 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 many times they fail to do something that is so easy to do, which is what you just described. 
um, in, 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 which is to go and talk to the person that didn't give them the promotion or didn't give them the project and investigate and get their feedback in a way that is um, uh, it, it, it's, it, it, to demonstrate that the reason, the reason why you're doing it is because you want to elevate your own game. You want to know what you, how you can prepare for the next time you have this opportunity to get a similar project, to get a similar promotion. And people are extremely receptive to, um, to giving that kind of feedback. And the surprising thing is that it doesn't happen that often. It really doesn't happen that often. So I think that's such a great takeaway that, that you did that. And I would wager that at some point in time, uh, uh, when if another project presents itself with that client, they're going to think about you a little bit differently because you really took the time to uh, uh, to uh, do a post mortem with them in, in terms of what you could have done better. And I think that's that's that is that's a true professional that does that. It's hard to know. It's hard to learn that in, when you're young, but and I learned that, and then I've migrated it to working with my own people where we've created a safe environment for let's call it calculated risk failure. Mm. There's a safety net here. And look, obviously That's architect, That's there's a safety net here where people can, can talk and share where, you know, they may have issues or if they're not understanding something, we never let anybody go too far with something that may just be starting with us if they don't really know what they're doing. Yes. Um, but we also let people fail, fail safely and without putting any project at risk. Obviously, architects, a project can fail, right? It could cause life safety. It could cause problems. So we, you know, thankfully, we don't have issues like that. But we let our team members take risk, calculated risk, and if they fail at it, they learn from it, but it's all done in a safe environment. Right. And so and it's, all, it's all talked through. A lot of times team members are afraid to say anything because they're thought of possibly risk losing their job. Sure. Now, under extreme circumstances, you know, it has to be evaluated. You know, we've got a good, you know, right here we've got very little turnover and when people come they they know that they're going to learn and they know that it's okay to make mistakes and that's the culture that we've promoted here and that is a culture that's not in every firm it really isn't so it's wonderful that uh, that that is something that you that that's part of the soul of, the, of your company i make mistakes <laughs> yeah yeah it was uh, i had a very interesting conversation with someone the other day that uh, this this reminds me and we were talking about um uh, performance and they were asking me about my you know my athletic career my amateur athletic career uh, i was never a professional boxer just you know uh you know olympic level and um uh i was i was explaining to them that um being involved in something that's competitive uh, that's not professional, right? Uh, where, where it's not your profession, but where you're you're competitive when you're maybe younger or sports or um, you know whatever that what, whatever it is, it was about being competitive, uh, where you can practice and suffer tremendous loss during those practice sessions, and that those losses are the, the pain and the suffering of uh, of, of experiencing the losses in practice when things are not on the line helps to build a certain type of rigor in you and helps to build the, the uh, it helps to eliminate the crushing emotional experience that you can have when you actually are out in a, not a simulated environment anymore, but in the real environment and you're putting something into practice and you fail you're not completely crushed. You're not immobilized. You're not deteriorated. You're sitting back and you're looking and you're realizing, oh, I just need to go back to the drawing board. I need to look at myself and I need to do what I think some find very difficult when they don't have you know, this, this opportunity to, to practice in a simulated world. In, in sports, it's you know, when you're an amateur, you're in the training camp, uh, 
uh, to, to, to be able to look at yourself and say, you know, I'm really not as good as I think I am. I, now, I, just, I, I, I just had an obstacle and I was, an, I was unable to overcome it. I have to go back to the drawing board and I have to do what's really hard. I have to change. And I have to keep changing and keep modifying my behavior until I start to find that my edge, my own personal edge that allows me to overcome that particular obstacle. And I think that people who don't have that experience, it can be that much more difficult for them when they're in the business world and they suffer that failure. They just don't know how to deal with failure. And unfortunately, uh, they can sometimes abandon ship, leave the business, switch careers, you know, uh, dramatically um, uh, because they, th those failures are really, really tough to deal with. So it's wonderful that you create this safe place that allow people to be able to have those failures in a professional realm um, uh, so that they can, they, can, they can grow personally and they can learn to overcome those things and just, and, 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 and you know, execute better. Look, it applies to your personal life as well. You, know, you want to teach your children the, oh, yeah. the exact same philosophy. Yeah. And especially now, you know, kids that are coming out of college that are looking for work and lost a college experience, you know, they're, they're feeling a lot of this failure of themselves. And sure. it's, a, it's a parent's job <laughs> to learn, to teach them what they've learned in the business world and carry it over to the personal world. Yes, of course. I, I have I have three little children myself, and um, uh, one of the things that I say to my children all the time, uh, they're they're almost exhausted by it. Uh, I, I say to them just I say to them, be very careful how you behave. This is my sports background. Be very careful how you behave, because you will become exactly how you behave. And they look at me and I say, uh, you know, you, if you are a nice person. You will become, an, if you behave like a nice person, you will become a nice person. If you behave like a jerk, you will become a jerk. It's very hard. It's almost impossible. If you're doing the same thing over and over and over and over again and behaving in, a, in the same way over and over again, it's very hard not to become that. Sure. It can sometimes be hard to imagine that you're going to be something or think that you want to do something but it's really about the action that you take it's the action that will help you become who you are and so that's how i explain it to my my three young girls that they that they will become exactly how they behave uh but i think that you know the when we think about profiles and i'm so happy that you you took the time to talk uh uh to me today pleasure it's about helping people figure out those those behaviors and and those those systems and those strategies that they can em employ, uh, uh, you know, to to help them sort of get out of the rut, to help them advance, to help them, you know, um, operate, uh, you know, a, as a high performer in whatever industry or whatever sector that they that they want to pursue. It's all about ethic. It's all about personal work ethic, personal um, confidence in yourself. Yes. You know, like no matter what day of the week is my day starts at 4 30 in the morning and i i go to this is your system this is your night. daily system you have a system i have a very clear system that i follow oh, we'd love to hear that I'm, I'm flexible in what happens during the day but my morning routine sets the tone for me seven days a week okay and that is how i'm able to smile and laugh and, and enjoy my life and bring joy to those that you know work for me with me and my family so it makes it crazy take, take us through a, take us through sort of uh that 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 daily schedule if you don't mind that would be really so, wonderful for everyone listening. Uh, real quick 4 30 in the morning um i'm up i naturally wake up doesn't matter what day of the week it is yep. I, I spend about 20 25 minutes going through all the overnight emails and correspondences because we are a global practice and we're working with folks in Australia and in Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Abu Dhabi and Dubai. And so I spend my time because they're 14 hours plus ahead of us. Um, I get to myself around 5, 5.15 and I spend 75 minutes in full body workout. Um, I have a trainer that 
is up with me at that hour. Okay. And uh, we work very hard, very, very hard. I finish. I take a tremendous amount of supplements that I put in my body every morning um, that has allowed me just to go throughout my day. And um, I go hard. I don't eat any breakfast. Okay. I have a very small lunch and I just plow through the day, but I'm very, very effective in and focused on tasks. I, I multitask, but I'm not doing multitasking. Okay. To be successful, you got to get yeah. through one thing at a time, finish it, and then move on. 100%. The distraction is very little. And then by the time I get home in the evening, I'm able to put all that down and convert back to husband and father and spend the time that I need to with my family and those who are living with us still because of the pandemic. And I have grown children, so it's different than the younger kids that you have. And get into bed and do it all over again the next morning. Yeah, it's, it's good. I, 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 I'm so happy you went through that. What, I, I want to ask, when you get up at 4.30, I think that some people need some help with this. You can have a tremendously productive day, um, and you still have time in the evening for your personal yeah. life. But what time do you go to bed? About eleven o'clock. I only need about four and a half hours of sleep. Okay, that's okay. Okay, I need a little more, but I find, quite honestly, personally, sleeping is underrated. Is overrated. It bores me. Most of the time, I sit there, lay there, and I'm just thinking about what I got to do and really when I want to get yeah, up. You're up with your notepad by your uh, bedside all night. I'm sure your as your mind is uh, processing new ideas constantly. I live by I'll sleep when I'm dead. Great, that's amazing. Okay, I want to ask you a couple because I'm I'm super excited. I want to hear some. There are a couple things I want to ask you before uh, you know we go because uh, I don't want to take it uh, 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 take up too much of your time. Um, I, I'd love to hear about some of the projects that you're really most excited about. That's number one. Number two is I, we'd love to hear um, um, uh, because I think that you're growing, and so you're probably out there looking for some talent. And so what would you be looking for if anyone's, you know, if, if there's anyone aspiring that would love to have someone like you as a mentor who loves your, the, the organization that you describe, you know, what, what are some of the things that you might be looking for and how do people get in touch with you? But I'd love to start off with just some of the projects that you have been super proud of over the years that you guys have accomplished. So, so we are, have become really a very diverse practice. You know, the firm originally was founded as just simply being an architect on Long Island back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The firm has since obviously established its presence in New York City yep. um, and now on a national and global platform. And the it, because we are so diverse, you know, we're, lot, we're not locked into a particular project typology. And so we're involved in some of the most creative work right now um, in our sports and entertainment practice, our hospitality practice, our multifamily practice, mid-rise, high-rise, okay. and our modular net zero energy practice are our strengths right now. The corporate interior market is coming back very, very strong and very, very quickly. Here in New York in particular, not just the absorption of the sublease market, which is substantial in the city, but diminishing every day. But clients that are now looking at fresh, original, large square footage in the city. And right now, you know, we're being considered for over 650,000 feet currently in the city. Amazing. Are completing 450,000 feet over the next three months. So our interior market is, is very stable and growing. But um, our work overseas of what we're going to be doing in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and in UAE are on the giga project size. Not projects, but they call them giga projects. Amazing. And we have a partner now in Australia that we're working with for these projects. And they are, going, they are special and unique onto themselves. <clears throat> and we are getting ready to announce an incredible project in Midtown Manhattan, one of a kind, never has been done before in the city, 
very large in the entertainment venue that I can't really speak about yet. Okay. You'll hear about it when it comes, but it's well, going to be- We'd love to have you back and, 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 and draw further attention to it. 30 days, I'll be able to more about it. Um, so yes, to answer your question, um, we are seeing a tremendous amount of resumes now, a lot of phenomenal talent that lost their jobs during the pandemic. Sure. Here in the New York area, which I think on a per architect basis, capita basis, there were more layoffs than anywhere else in the country. Wow. Um, thankfully, uh, us and our contemporaries are slowly but surely bringing people back into the workforce, which is indicative of the strength of the market that's returning to New York. And very grateful that's happening to the profession. So yes, the answer is, I'm always looking for great talent, whether I'm hiring or not. I've hired the best people that work for us when I wasn't looking for them. Right. And so I'm always meeting people. I'm always talking with people virtually now live again about what they can bring to my culture. I'm not just looking for a project manager or a designer or an architect. I'm looking for someone that wants to enjoy and have passion for the field that can contribute to our culture. And they're out there. And so if people want to get in contact with me, I'm, I'm an open book. Great. Uh, my email address is readily available. Um, our website has all our information on it, spectagroup.com. And LinkedIn, my LinkedIn profile, is very easy to communicate with. That's terrific. Mark, this has been a really great session. Um, uh, I, I thank you so much for- My pleasure. Time. Thank you. It's great. Absolutely great. You look great, by the way. What's that? You look great. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> feeling good, feeling good. Uh, well, you know, we're 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 all working to get back, uh, you know, to some sense of normalcy, and uh, it's starting to look look pretty good. It's really optimistic to hear about all of the great projects that you're working on, and uh, you, clearly, uh, New York City, the rest of the United States is coming out of, coming out of a really really bad. Um, um, uh, place. But recently, uh, I just read, I think it was just two or three days ago, maybe it was over the weekend, actually, that our that our infection rate is less than 1% in New York City. And if you can remember, we were the capital. I mean, it was we had, you know, we had that just an astonishing number of daily deaths, you know, back in March. So, you know, for us to get to you know, negative 1% in infection rate is really a testament to just how diligently and how hard everyone in the country has been working from the administration, uh, you know, down to, to, to the local. We need to continue to be diligent about it and, you know, just keep an eye out on it and be careful. And, but I, I feel great about it. I've taken the term bouncing back. I don't like the word back. So now everything for me is bouncing forward. Bouncing forward. I like that. New York is bouncing forward. We are all bouncing forward. And this will be in the rear view mirror. Right. You. I love it. I love bouncing back. Uh, 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 moving forward. A constant in the state of, of forward motion. Yep. That's I love it. I love it. Mark, thank you again. Um, uh, it was super happy. I, I'm super happy to have had you as our as our very first episode. Super appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for uh, tuning in. I'm Sean Black. I'll see you on the other side. Thanks, Sean. Awesome.